So, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the Central Asia program. My name is Sebastian Virus. I'm a research professor here working with this uh, program. Well, I, today I'm extremely happy to welcome two first wonderful economists and world specialists of Central Asia, especially in Kazakhstan. And I would say that I'm all the more happy uh, to have two economists today is that in our uh, Central Asia program se uh, monthly seminars, uh, which by the way have become more weekly seminars now, uh, we uh, have a lot of events on social issues, on political issues, on the region, but mm, less, I would say, on, uh, on the economy. So today we have two wonderful specialists, uh, the, uh, with David Kim, with, uh, who is Professor uh, and Moist Chair in the Department of Economics at the University of Memphis. Uh, Professor Kim received his PhD in economics from the Ohio State University. He works on monetary policy, on developmental finance and financial crisis, macroeconometric modeling, and forecasting in transition economies. And uh, he has published a lot in, uh, the, in many journals, in the review uh, of development economics, in the International Review of Economics and Finance, in the Review of International Economics, and uh, among others. And here is uh, you know, one of his uh, articles that you can find online, I guess. And you can have a copy for those uh, who uh, are interested, and I guess all of you will be very interested in reading that. And our second presenter is uh, Kasim Khan Kaparov, who is uh, staying with us in our Central Asia program. He's a Central Asia program visiting fellow. But uh, Kasim Khan is also a director at Bureau of Economic Research of Kazakhstan uh, in Almaty. He received his MBA from Yokohama National University in Japan. Uh, uh, and his current research includes, uh, and, and you had your BA in economics from Al Farabi Kazakh National University, sorry, in Kazakhstan. And uh, his current research includes the National Oil Fund of Kazakhstan and its influence on the economic development in Kazakhstan and the issue of external debt of the state-owned enterprises in Kazakhstan. So today, Professor Kim and uh, Kasim Han will present on the evolution of the National Oil Fund of Kazakhstan, inception, utilization, and expectation. So the floor is yours. Uh, and after the presentation, of course, we will have a discussion. Thank you, and welcome to the Central Asia Program. Thank, thank, thank you thank for you. being here today. Well, thank you. It's my pleasure. Uh, I really appreciate the invitation and the opportunity to talk today. Um, what I'm going to do, the way we've divided up the tasks um, in terms of the presentation, I'm going to start, uh, and by the way, I brought about 20 copies of the summary of this paper, which are here if anyone wants to take a copy uh, with you. Um, so I'm going to start by talking about sovereign wealth funds in general and then try to look at the funds of Kazakhstan. Uh, I mean, there's an S there, the funds. Uh, and then uh, Kazim is going to talk very specifically about the oil fund. Uh, we have some information prepared about some of uh, Kazna, which is yet a different fund, but we won't get to it today, I'm sure. Uh, and then I'm going to offer some um, uh, summary and conclusions. Um, first, I have to acknowledge that this paper and the work uh, that I'm presenting is the result of a Title VIII State Department grant from a few years ago, which I deeply appreciate. The paper itself is uh, still online, and the DOI is also on this um, uh, paper I handed out. And Kasim, of course, is here uh, with a lot of research support. Uh, from the Source Kazakhstan Fund and uh, this institute is a gracious host. Um, so what we're going to do is talk about sovereign wealth funds uh, and an overview of what they are, what the issues are with sovereign wealth funds, not just in Kazakhstan, but in general. Uh, and the issues are wide-ranging. 
both in terms of the host country itself, issues within Kazakhstan about what the sovereign wealth funds are doing, but also the recipient countries where they invest money and what they do with the money, since most of the money is invested abroad. Uh, and the whole intent is to prevent the oil revenues from hitting the local economy in sort of an unpredictable uh, fashion. Uh, so to do that, they collect the revenues and send it right back uh, abroad uh, to elsewhere. Um, and we'll uh, define them, uh, and there are many different uh, definitions, but um, basically are pools of assets that are owned and managed directly or indirectly by governments to achieve national objectives, whatever those objectives might be, and they vary. Uh, we'll talk about those in a minute. The funding comes either from foreign exchange reserves that are collected at the national bank due to normal trade activities, uh, royalties on the sale of natural resources, which tends to be the biggest source of funds for most of the sovereign wealth funds, or sometimes general tax revenues. Um, this uh, second one repeats it. Uh, that in a more formal way, and this IWG was the International Working Group on Sovereign Wealth Funds, and that's been formalized uh, now, uh, and we'll talk about that. That's the IWG of the IMF. And basically they have multiple purposes. Uh, they can be used for macroeconomic stabilization, uh, they can be savings funds, savings for future generations. It's a wealth transfer mechanism. Uh, reserve investment corporations, development funds, uh, and pension reserve funds. In the case of Kazakhstan, I'll use this. Um, we'll talk, and Tassim Khan will talk more about specific ones. The, in every country, it's completely different. So there isn't a good single model. But you'll see elements of all of these uh, types of funds that are mentioned here in each country. And where they are located institutionally uh, varies. But what makes Kazakhstan so complicated, and I became interested in this when I was working on a project with the National Bank of Kazakhstan on monetary policy, simply because we could not figure out what was going on in the balance sheet of the National Bank and how monetary policy was affecting the economy. So um, this is um, kind of um, a, a, a research topic that was forced upon me, so how, uh, if you can put it that way. And uh, as was mentioned, I was trained as a Soviet uh, specialist at Ohio State, and ever since then, I have been described as someone who has a pathological interest in research on countries where there is no or really bad data. So uh, for an economist to work with no data is really uh, not easy. So at the National Bank, we will have the National Oil Fund, and there's about $64 billion there. Now we have the pension fund, about 18 billion. Uh, foreign exchange reserves, uh, about 19 billion. And then something called the National Investment Company, uh, which is about 0.8 billion. Um, these are relatively, some of them are very new. Uh, the pension fund was moved to the National Bank in 2014. Uh, there was a pension fund, uh, but also individual insurance companies offering private pensions, <coughs> which were nationalized and uh, put under the management of the National Bank in 2014. Uh, the National Investment Corporation was created in 2012. Um, and then the National Oil Fund is the oldest organization, about 2,000. Now what's important is, this is, it says fund, it's not a legal entity. It's simply an account at the National Bank, and there is a management council, uh, mainly 
uh, the, the, the President, uh, Minister of Finance, Minister of Economy and Budget Planning, uh, the head of the Parliament and the Senate. Uh, there are ten individuals on this, all government <coughs> officials that are coincident, well, almost all appointed by the President of the country, except for the Parliament and Senate. Um, the pension fund um, is also uh, administered, um, but not directed by the National Bank. Foreign exchange reserves, this is the typical central bank, national bank function. The National Investment Company uh, is too new to say what it does, but we'll see that it's comparable to some other organizations, say in Singapore. The model there is to have an oil fund and a national investment company. Uh, and the function of the national investment companies typically are not only to buy assets, but to manage them as well. So they take big positions in companies, uh, usually abroad, uh, and effectively they're acting like a hedge fund, um, but it's for investment purposes rather than savings or anything else. Um, and you can see uh, these functions, the way they match up, uh, this is stabilization and savings, this is pension, this is foreign reserves. Um, and then here we have some work. Uh, Kazna, which is a joint stock company, legal entity, with a single shareholder in the Ministry of Finance. And it holds, owns, many different firms. Um, some, uh, and it's a very significant amount of the economy, so that it's still nationally owned. Um, and what the big issue is, what's going on here in the middle, because the National Oil Fund and the National Bank, the National Bank has a normal, regular monetary policy functions you know, modifying the money supply, controlling interest rates, and so forth. And the linkages are through the capital markets, the financial markets, which are very weakly developed. And you, you have these occasional flows that are from these funds uh, to the uh, real sector of the economy, individual companies held by SK or SK itself for various purposes and this is a problem and I'll talk about the problems in general but in this scheme we'll see all of the issues that I'll point out for sovereign wealth funds in general are appearing in Kazakhstan as a matter of ordinary business a uh, matter of course Okay, so this is simply to provide some perspective on the size and scope of sovereign wealth funds in general. Um, the total assets um, are estimated uh, at three and a half trillion. That is at best a modest or a good guess uh, because uh, a lot of the data uh, is estimated. Many do not report anything, and those that do, the reporting methods are not. Uh, especially good, and they're described as notoriously secret. Not all of them, and I'll show you some examples, uh, but the Sovereign Wealth Fund Institute in uh, Switzerland, I think, which is also uh, could be described as notoriously secret, but not, not notoriously, but not very... Uh, uh, it's a commercial operation, so if you want information, you have to buy it. And there's some things that they do as well. But they estimated $7 trillion in 2011. And they estimate 7 to $10 trillion was the range given in 2011. And in 2015, they say about $7 trillion. But again, these are wide-ranging estimates. Uh, because when you look at these things, it's going to be difficult to, to add them up. Uh, and if you... Um, get these rough estimates in assets and try to get an idea of their size. And the next slide will show you how 
big they are relative to capital markets in the world. But here, what I want to emphasize is the transparency of sovereign wealth funds. What are they reporting, uh, and uh, can you judge the transparency of the fund itself? Um, and, of course, Truman at the Peterson Institute has uh, calculated this transparency index in Lindbergh Maduel uh, index out of, they have a score of 1 to 10, and Peterson is 1 to 100. Um, they do line up more or less. Peterson is, as he says, subjective but completely transparent in how he calculates the index. Um, and the methodology is well defined and described in his work. The other, I can't find any idea of how that number is calculated. But, um, and so I don't, you know, I would take Truman's scores um, as a pretty good indicator. And I've used the same methodology. So they're looking at the, the transparency of the sovereign wealth fund, in this case the national fund, I did the same thing for companies in San Francisco uh, as they prepare for privatization. Uh, so if you look at uh, the size of sovereign wealth funds relative to stock markets uh, or relative to the bond market of individual countries, and I've done this for both, uh, you can see that they're not uh, big enough, not likely to be big enough to affect a capital market uh, in a developed economy. But certainly, you know, for smaller capital markets, if they wanted to, they could probably do something uh, unpleasant. And, you know, there's always rumors in these countries that somebody's intervening in the stock market and so forth. Um, so for any one sovereign wealth fund, it would be difficult. But if for some reason they acted in concert, for some reason, they could uh, maybe affect a market or affect the market sentiment. And uh, when the price of oil fell, uh, for some reason, beyond normal economic linkages between the price of oil, oil companies, and their share of the stock market, the stock market went way down as a result, and it was clear that the Gulf, the oil producers were liquidating assets uh, for financing their fiscal budgets. And that received a little bit of press attention, but uh, it's really impossible to quantify. So now that the price of oil has stabilized, for some reason the stock market has as well. Um, and the paper has more detail on this. So the issue really, you know, from my perspective, initially was, does this matter? Should we be concerned at all about sovereign wealth funds and the impact on the global economy? And if you look at the literature, um, people in law and political economy tend to say or emphasize the negative aspects of sovereign wealth funds, the potential for market disruption, anti-competitive behavior, uh, exploiting target companies, technology, pursuit of sovereign interests, so for business interests and so forth. Uh, in the finance literature, there's generally no criticisms at all, but uh, you know it's argued that they're generally stable, uh, passive, beneficial, long-term investors, which add liquidity to the market, reduce volatility, and so forth. In the economics literature, there's very little interest unless you're a specialist really focusing on this. Uh, and, uh, and if you're into to political economic philosophy or ideology, you know, should these things even exist uh, is, uh, you know, the question at play. Uh, if we're in a free market economy, who owns the resources? Who do they belong to? And should, who are the owners and have the claim on the income that they produce? Um, you know, on one extreme, you can say God gave the earth to all in common, so everybody should get a share. At least in Alaska, they say that, you know, this is our, my oil. Uh, on the other hand, you can say that the state, the government, uh, should own, control the assets on behalf 
of the citizens in that country. Um, but um, the, the bottom line test is, are they effective in meeting the goals set out? Okay. Uh, so for the host country, the concerns, the host country um, concerns, um, that is Kazakhstan's concerns uh, of, of uh, what the Sovereign Wealth Fund is doing uh, and the citizens should be uh, aware of is that because they have this huge financial backstop, uh, which can be used for economic stabilization, it can also be used to bail out failing banks that should be uh, allowed to fail. <clears throat> so there are a lot of undesirable macroeconomic and financial policies that uh, are undesirable in the long run that are undertaken in the short run for political reasons. Uh, and of course, Kasekin uh, Kamo mentioned, talk about this as, as well. Um, that's what's happening in um, Kazakhstan. And uh, basically, market discipline is lost. And so the functioning, the benefits of the market economy and forcing firms to, be, to perform uh, efficiently in pursuit of profits, uh, that kind of disappears as if, if, if uh, there's a pool of money available to the government to bail out certain companies for certain reasons. Okay. Uh, and uh, this, I don't know if this is true in Kazakhstan, but certainly in some of the Gulf Coast, uh, the Gulf countries, you see a rentier class of political elites. There's no uh, accountability, um, you know, so taxes are low um, and accountability is low. Uh, if you happen to be a, from the royal family, that's perfectly fine. Uh, if you're not, then it could be different. Um, the other thing is um, how the resources are used. Uh, because uh, it would be great if all of the investments were in uh, highly desirable, productive, uh, long-term beneficial assets. Uh, but they could finance um, the Asian Development Games or other pet projects of, of politicians that are nice, but those are consumption goods rather than investment goods. Um, the biggest problem is um, the lack of clarity, organizational structure, uh, governance of the fund itself, and so forth. Um, and, and that leads to mistakes, um, because there isn't a lot of... Um, so the fiduciary responsibility of the managers of the fund is not uh, evaluated or enforced, um, and um, uh, no one is held accountable. So this is just an aside on what Truman and these other guys did uh, in calculating transparency, and that's a major criteria that we want to look at uh, when we look at sovereign wealth funds. Um, and I, I showed you those numbers. Um, so. The response is, you know, for uh, almost a decade, the IMF ran uh, a working group on sovereign wealth funds because there were concerns on both sides of the table, the OECD especially in terms of how outside investments were allocated within, uh, within the OECD and different regulations uh, country by country, and on the other side, um, uh, looking at the, re the uh, fiduciary responsibilities of the, the management for the long-term benefit. Uh, so uh, that working group was formalized, the International Forum of Sovereign Wealth Funds, and the Santiago principles were laid out. Uh, they're in the paper and you can find them online, but it's general, um, you know, the emphasis on accountability, transparency, uh, and so forth. And these principles address almost every issue that we can possibly raise, uh, except they're voluntary, and even the most, uh, the best managed <coughs> funds don't uh, comply with all of them, maybe with the exception of Norway, uh, which when you looked at those transparency scores was right at the top. That's, that's the poster child of the best sovereign wealth fund in the world. Um, and uh, Kazakhstan just became a member it's 
it might be described as an observer because it certainly doesn't comply with these principles. Okay, so now the funds in Kazakhstan. Uh, I put them here, uh, and they're all over in terms of institutional uh, organization, uh, legal entity versus a bank account at the National Bank. They're all over the, the chart. Um, the National Fund for the Future of Kazakhstan, the National Oil Fund, as I mentioned, is simply an account in the National Bank with a whole lot of money in it. And the Management Council are all high-level government officials, and they direct or they set on an annual basis the investment policy uh, for the fund and lay out what the portfolio should look like. Uh, and then uh, any expenditures from the fund have to be approved. Uh, the Integrated Accumulative Pension Fund um, is a pension fund uh, that's owned by the Ministry of Finance and managed uh, by the National Bank. And those are the individual accounts, uh, some of which uh, were original pension fund accounts of the government from uh, prior to transition uh, to the new accounts at, in the private sector insurance companies that were nationalized. Um, so in a sense, that's a step backwards from a, sort of a market-driven economy with the nationalization of the pension accounts. And then somewhere, because now, this is a bit confusing because they translate, or they call it a sovereign <coughs> wealth fund or sovereign welfare fund, uh, but it's not a fund at all. It's a holding company. It's a, uh, a, it's a joint stock company owned by the Ministry of Finance, which then itself owns uh, probably anywhere uh, close to, uh, it's hard to say, but probably a thousand entities are part of this, uh, either owned outright large companies, which then have wholly owned um, subsidiaries. <coughs> um, and that's where all of the action is. So it's this part which is kind of the most exciting thing in Kazakhstan now because these companies, uh, some of which have been partially privatized, some of which are on the list uh, for privatization for privatization in the people's IPO. Uh, and that's why I calculated these transparency indexes because the more transparent they are, the higher price they will fetch <coughs> in the market. So this is a, the really exciting part, but where does the money come from? Well, it's probably coming from over here. In fact, a lot of it's coming from over here, and Kasim Khan will, will probably talk a little bit about that. Um, and a lot of the investments being made from the oil fund and the pension fund, uh, they have simply thrown out the window the fiduciary responsibility of the management. So the pension funds are doing things that would never be done, uh, including bailing out failing banks. You know, you can imagine uh, a pension fund, a private pension fund, or even the Social Security Trust Fund, buying uh, a failed bank uh, during the financial crisis, buying Wells Fargo or uh, something like that. That's, that's a disaster for pensioners. Uh, so the pension fund money is not being managed in the best interest of pensioners in that instance. The other issue is the pension fund has problems obtaining uh, reasonably good sound securities to invest in to begin with, but that's, that's um, a different issue. So what we'll turn to now is to focus more carefully on the oil fund, uh, which there are lots of issues, uh, but there, I guess I want to emphasize there's a lot of interconnectedness uh, in, in this. Thank you, Professor Kenner, for such detailed and comprehensive background for um, what is known as National Fund of Kazakhstan. And uh, I will talk more about details of the fund, and uh, there will be a lot of numbers, but I will try to, make, to keep it uh, uh, logical. So, um, as previously was said, uh, nation, there is no such thing as a like legal entity that is called National Fund and has a building and has a sign. Uh, it's just an account with the Ministry of Finance and it's managed by the National Bank of Kazakhstan. 
mostly it's managed by the um, its treasury department, which outsources management to external um, asset managers, such big names as uh, BlackRock or JP Morgan or the, the big guys. Uh, the investment strategy is uh, set annually by the council, um, and uh, <coughs> it's, uh, it's just say which kind of uh, rate of return would be uh, advisable for the fund, and currently it's uh, more in a conservative mode because the fund was created more of like a future generations fund, more of a savings function. And, um, well, the Treasury Department of the National Bank is also manages the foreign exchange reserves. Uh, the, first of all, um, the fund was created back in 2011, so it was the first fund in the CIS to be created. Russia's, Russia's fund followed uh, several years later, and the initial amount was 660 million uh, from the sell, selling out of the uh, percentage in stake in um, Tengiz, uh, Chevrolet, and uh, it, uh, the fund has ever since increased, uh, fueled by the growing oil prices, and it peaked in 2014, August, uh, with 77 billion US dollars. Back then it was around 40%, uh, 50% of GDP, but uh, since uh, 2014 it's been declining, and currently it stands at 64 billion US dollars. So uh, this is just a comparative uh, dynamics regard as uh, of the national fund assets as percentage of GDP, and you can see that uh, for the past two years it, uh, there is a steady decline, um, down from 30 percent of GDP to estimated 25 percent. Um, so um, legal basis for the fund was uh, set up in 2000, the year 2000, by the decree of the president. Um, this decree founded the fund and uh, defined its purpose and operations. Five years later, the concept was changed, um, and uh, there was two kind of transfers introduced. One is a guaranteed annual transfer plan, and the other one is targeted, which is ad hoc transfer. I will talk about them uh, more in detail. Today. And at that time, guaranteed or planned transfer uh, amount was limited to one third of the uh, national fund in a given year. So each year you could withdraw from the fund no more than one third of it. And uh, the list of corporations, mostly oil, uh, oil and gas companies, who would pay the taxes into this fund was uh, decided upon each year. So the government had to sit down each year and define which companies would <coughs> pay taxes into the state budget and which companies' would, revenues would go into the National Oil Fund. So during this time it was a clear uh, conflict of interest because government wanted more, fu more funding into its uh, own budget rather than National Fund. That led to the new decree right after mass of the financial crisis in 2010 and uh, um, it's called the uh, New Concept. Uh, it defined that there is a two functions. First is a savings function. Uh, its goal is to have at least 30% of GDP stocked in the national fund. And the other one is stabilization function, which is uh, support that national fund provides into the state budget. So uh, the uh, one of the uh, new schemes that was introduced here is uh, the guaranteed or planned transfer was fixed as, a, as an amount ranging from 6.8% to 9.2%, uh, 6.8 billion US dollars to some, somewhat above 9 billion US dollars. And it was made uh, to set an expectation for the government that they cannot borrow more than that annually. Um, also, the scheme was changed in regards of how the fund is, um, uh, regarding the sources, for the fund, and uh, there was no list of companies now. Uh, all the revenues that comes from the uh, oil, um, so-called windfall profits, they all go directly into national fund. And then from the national fund, you receive annual transfer of maximum of nine billion US dollars. And there is ad hoc transfers that are defined each time when, when such need arises.
but uh, in 2014, when uh, there was a cri pre-crisis uh, symptoms in the economy, government has changed uh, some of these new concepts and uh, it lifted the restriction uh, for investing in shares of local companies, which is uh, can be seen as uh, indirect subsidies for not very efficient local companies. So this shows you the uh, example of how um, how government could actually go, it, it's a way around the restrictions that are set, currently set in the legislation. And uh, another one was that uh, the commission for mon monitoring the expenses of the national fund was established, but um, as you can see, out of 16 members of this commission, only four were elected uh, officials, uh, members of parliament. Um, two of them were from the Senate, which is not elected but appointed, and two of them were from the lower chamber, which is selected. So uh, the rest was mostly government officials, and uh, the head of the commission is a national bank governor who is responsible for managing the national fund. Um, sources of funds, as currently, it's um, it could be direct budget transfers. This is not the case anymore uh, since the establishment of the fund. Um, next is all the direct taxes coming from extractive industries, uh, corporate income tax, excess, bonuses, royalties, PSA, oil and gas, rent tax. Um, also other oil sector receipt, receipts, it's like uh, fees or fines for oil and gas, uh, ecological fines. Revenues from privatization and sales of land. Uh, still it's a small fraction, but uh, now privatization is uh, supposed to be a big uh, income for the fund. And uh, last but not the least, investment income well, for the assets that already invested. So this is the dynamics for the sources of the fund. And you can see that mostly it's a direct taxes. It's uh, in blue. Um, and direct taxes have been decreasing for the last two years. So in 2014 it was almost 20 billion US dollars, but uh, last year it, it was only 5 billion US dollars. So uh, you could see that uh, the decline in oil prices has its direct impact into the national funds uh, income. As per my uh, model that I calculated the uh, dependency of the national oil funds revenue to oil uh, prices. Uh, the uh, cutoff price for the oil is 30 uh, US dollars per barrel for Brent. Um, everything that, uh, when the price goes below 30 uh, dollars, then the national oil fund doesn't see any revenue at all. So uh, last year we can see that the revenue was just 5 uh, billion US dollars. It means that the average oil price was just a little bit above this cutoff point of 30 US dollars. And uh, on the other hand, we see that uh, for the last two years there is a high investment income. Uh, it's very hard to define why, because uh, uh, in 2014 um, the estimated rate of return was 14% for the fund. It's comparable with the rate of return for the Norwegian uh, pension fund in 2013. So that, that could be justifiable. But in 2015, we see the rate of return of uh, 25%. And, uh, well, it's... Sorry. Yeah. What is the source of the data? It's Ministry of Finance. Okay. Official website. Yeah. Um, as as uh, previously was said, there is a lack of uh, transparency with the fund. So we don't see uh, its investment portfolio. And we cannot say which class of investment uh, or which type of investment brought this kind of investment income. Yeah. Back to that. Um, quick question. Do the standards which are used in computing those figures, are they maintained from year to year? Because if they are and they use the same standard in 2016 that they used in 2015, and things yeah. go down, it may shrink excessively too. Mm -hmm. yeah. Do they hold uh, they here to the same yeah. standards? I wonder. There was no footnote or anything. Yeah, okay. I believe that for 2015, <laughs> so what they refer to investment income includes uh, some sort of revaluation due to the depreciation of the currency. 
that's possibly one of the explanations. Because that's what they, I mean, I work at the fund yeah. in Kazakhstan, and that's what they told us so for the, yeah. the last quarter they had left. So they included the, the uh, depreciation of the currency there. It's kind of that for us, it's a bit weird to do. Uh, but this so, data is reported in dollars and most of the investment is in So dollars. actually what we found, so that's why I asked you about regarding the data. Because if you look at the data from the Minister of Finance and uh, the Minister mm -hmm. and the NMBK data, it's kind of difficult to, to, to match them. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's what I'm struggling right. with. So um, mm -hmm. actually I'm working on the dynamics of the NFRK and the impact of the economy as well. So I'm having some kind of issues in the in explaining some movements. Also that's why I was kind of surprised when you mentioned a couple of slides before the decree 794 that basically was lifted because actually... We can come, yeah. come back to that. Yeah, I mean, you know we'll have a good discussion okay, so after yeah, that. Yeah. Yeah. Probably on some okay. of your questions I will have yeah. answers later in the presentation. So, uh, out of these direct taxes, uh, the structure is uh, as following. So, the mostly it's a mineral resource extraction tax and the corporate income tax that uh, provides most of the input. And uh, as you see, last year it, it was shrinking uh, in all types of taxes. So, as for the uses of funds for the national fund, is um, there is three uh, channels from which the money can be uh, funneled from the fund. First is the guaranteed transfers. It's uh, limited to 9.2 billion US dollars per year. Uh, second is a targeted transfer, which is ad hoc transfers, and uh, they are these transfers are done only by the decree of the president and on the goals that is defined by the president. And the uh, overheads is the management and external uh, audit fee fees. Um, it's around 50, it's more or less stable, 50 million US dollars per year. Uh, so users of funds, uh, the, the dynamics is, is following. Uh, guaranteed transfers, uh, mostly stable. Uh, targeted transfers, which is ad hoc transfers, uh, occurred two times in 2008 and 2009. It was to overcome the financial uh, crisis. And uh, last two years, 14 and 15. Uh, and here, one thing to note is that when um, transfer <coughs> occurred in 2014, the oil price, the global oil price, was still uh, above 100 US dollars. So it was not. Um, caused by the drop in the oil price, but mostly with the structural problems within the economy. <coughs> As for portfolio structure, uh, this is the data from 2011. Uh, this is the, the most recent that we could obtain. Um, uh, as per this data, 80% of, uh, of the portfolio is allocated into government bonds. Uh, and 20% is in equities. So it's pretty conservative portfolio. Uh, what are the main challenges of the national fund? Well, first of all, it's a uh, high reliance over the state budget on the national fund. Uh, so we see that the uh, guaranteed transfers, uh, they cover almost 25% of annual expenditures of uh, the state budget. and. Uh, in the last two years, the tax revenues of the budget has dropped uh, almost 40%. Um, targeted transfers, um, another issue is that uh, targeted transfers, they are not uh, limited, and uh, they're, uh, the reason why they could be used is not defined in the legislat legislation. It uh, can be used for any kind of purposes defined by the president. So back in 2008 and 2009, um, out of 10 billion US dollars uh, of these targeted transfers, 9 billion was spent on uh, saving one bank, uh, which was a BTA bank. Some of the money was spent on uh, uh, financing Asian Winter Games, which is, cannot be considered as a long-term development goal. Um, uh, as I said previously, uh, targeted transfer of 2014 was mostly caused by the structural problems in the economy and uh, unresolved uh, and non-performing loans of the banks that was coming dragging from 2008 and uh, the, there was no reforms made uh, during the high oil price period so in 2014 it uh, backfired to the government and it had to provide these additional transfers 
Um, so we expect to have uh, more targeted transfers in next three years, 16 to 18. Uh, it's more or less uh, defined. It will be three uh, billion US dollars per year for the infrastructure development mostly. And uh, but there is still a high uh, possibility of additional um, uh, targeted transfers occurring because there is no um, clear limitation in the legislation and it, it all depends on what will be the situation in the economy, in the budget uh, revenues and in the oil price dynamics. So um, especially we see that the government has borrowed extensively for the last two years because uh, tax uh, revenues has dropped and uh, government's debt actually increased twice in the last two years which is pretty uh, alarming. Uh, talking more about the lack of transparency, so um, decisions on the targeted transfers which was 10 billion uh, five years ago and now uh, now 5 billion combined is 15 billion US dollars they are made without any public uh, discussion, without no uh, parliament hearing, so uh, it's totally uh, non-transparent. <coughs> More, moreover, the lack of predictability of such transfers, it causes economic agents to uh, wonder which kind of uh, events could cause or trigger these kind of transfers. So there is no clear uh, rule. Uh, another one is lack of accountability, because uh, public reporting on performance of uh, national fund is not uh, disclosed, it's not detailed, and you cannot see the portfolio structure. Even comparing with the uh, sovereign fund, uh, oil fund of the Azerbaijan, uh, which provides much more details on what kind of assets and types of investments they invest into. And another one is sustainability. Um, well, the issue with that is that uh, there is no law uh, on the oil fund and uh, the whole operation of the oil fund is regulated by the decrees of president. So it was, first of all, created by the decree, and then uh, all the rules were changed by the decrees. Uh, this uh, leads to the institutional fragility, uh, uncertain management practices, and there is no clear entity that, is, that can be held responsible for the performance of the national fund or for its success or failure. Um, so, some of the recommendations how to overcome these challenges <coughs> include, first of all, it's uh, Santiago principles that are uh, globally recognized international best practices, and Kazakhstan should adhere to that. Um, first of all, we need to adopt a separate law on the National Oil Fund to put it under the supervision of Parliament, to put it uh, within the legal uh, uh, landscape then make explicit a priori uh, reasons why you can uh, withdraw targeted transfers uh, for which causes for if the oil price goes lower than this level or if there is a natural disaster occurring or if there is a, uh, some military action going on or some threat to national security um, the transfers from all the transfers from the national funds should be part of the state budget and go in through a regular approval process from the parliament to make it more transparent and definitely there should be a limit for the maximum withdraw annual withdrawal from the fund and that should be uh, defined as percentage of uh, state budget expenditures so and this percentage should be declining uh, there should be a certain plan to, to decrease this percentage so the government state budget would go would uh, decrease its dependency on oil prices. Uh, one uh, important thing is the institute institutionalization of uh, national fund. Uh, so there is already expenses around 50 million US dollars for its management currently. So uh, it will not require any additional uh, funding. And. Uh, of course, there should be annual reports for the Parliament with the disclosure of all uh, non-sensitive non -sensible, non -sensible information on the activities and performance of the fund. So, that was a more detailed look at the National Fund of Kazakhstan, and now I'm giving the floor for some summaries and conclusions, and then we can move to questions.
Okay, some of this we uh, have already mentioned, uh, and uh, so I can go through it pretty quickly. Uh, the, the important thing is that when we talk about Kazakhstan and Sovereign Wealth Fund is to realize that there are multiple funds for different purposes. Uh, and we can argue about how well each of them is managed to meet that particular purpose. Uh, for the oil fund, the primary purposes were uh, savings and stability, and, and there are two distinct funds within that. Um, it's been used heavily for stabilization, uh, and the savings function is defined. The size, the portion of the savings fund relative to GDP is not less than 30%, uh, and it has never fallen behind below that, but the stabilization component is what's being spent occasionally, and uh, the former uh, president of the National Investment Fund was fired for public publicly saying that the funds are not being managed properly. Um, uh, the foreign exchange reserves of the National Bank, uh, again, this is a standard uh, operation for all national banks, and they're generally well managed in part because they have a lot, but they have been falling as well because uh, they, Kazakhstan has been running a current account deficit even when they're exporting huge amounts of oil. Uh, the integrated accumulative pension fund, uh, I think, is an issue uh, because it's a pension fund and it's not being managed like a pension fund. Um, and um, the, the uh, and it's very controversial at the National Bank. The former head of the National Bank, Marchenko, was very much opposed to the nationalization and very much opposed to bringing it into the National Bank. And then he was um, uh, asked to resign uh, very quickly. And uh, things <coughs> progressed. Count Beatov uh, came in. Uh, but I don't think, you know, to be honest, they really have a good idea about what fiduciary responsibility means, uh, both for the oil fund and the pension fund, because of the investments they are making. The national fund, for example, uh, when Kasim Khan was mentioning the, the transfers, uh, there were two types. One was a direct capital grant. They just gave the money to SK. Uh, others were purchase of bonds, uh, and the bonds were at a low market rates and very negative real rates. Uh, and the pension fund, uh, and that was from the national fund to bail out uh, Cosagro and SK uh, at the financial, during the financial crisis. The most recent um, bailout of the banks um, was also uh, the purchase of bonds at negative real rates uh, from the pension fund. Uh, so, and that's more or less uh, totally irresponsible because uh, pensioners, uh, individuals do retire and uh, what's there is an open question. Um, maybe they're counting on $100 oil again. Um, when, when you look at the effectiveness of the National Fund and of SK, um, there are a lot of good things. Um, <laughs> Uh, like it does, it is useful for macro, macro stabilization. Um, but the, the real issue is that it allows the government or particular ministries uh, and the managers at SK to avoid really difficult decisions. Uh, the banks that are failing, uh, so this is since 2008, uh, is when they became insolvent, and it's been eight years, and some of them uh, have been resolved, others not. Uh, and at some point, you just have to say goodbye to those banks. Shareholders lose, depositors are insured, people are unhappy. But, uh, of course, people are unhappy now, but they'll be even unhappier when they retire and they have nothing in the pension fund. Um, the the targeted transfers um, are sometimes highly desirable, sometimes not. Um, and uh, the targeted transfers in this case from the oil fund to bail out 
sorry, from the pension fund to bail out the, the banks. That's highly undesirable. It's not coming from the oil fund, though. So the pension fund and the oil fund are two distinct things, and uh, both can be mismanaged. Um, and I have to say, you know, based on my experience, it really depends on the people that are responsible in management. Um, the, I think one of the most um, important things is they actually are paying attention to the Santiago Principles and they're a member of the International Forum, uh, which signals that at least they know what they should be doing or where they should be going. Uh, and it may be difficult to uh, get there, but at least uh, I think there's a sense of awareness of the issues. And it takes time. You know, people have to be trained and learn their responsibilities in, in these new um, um, organizations. Um, so I think, you know, there's a lot of uh, unanswered questions. There's a half a dozen PhD dissertations here for sure. Um, and uh, it can go in all kinds of uh, directions. Um, and, you know, I, you know, when I talk to people there, they often retur refer to the shareholder. So the Ministry of Finance may be thought of as the shareholder, but they are referring to someone else as the shareholder. Um, uh, the rest of these things are sort of philosophical, um, whether you believe in intergenerational equity and so forth. Um, one solution is to give a little bit like in Alaska, you know, an end of year bonus from uh, their tax office and individuals can decide what to do with that money. They can save it or they can spend it. Uh, that could be done in any of these countries. Okay. Well, let's stop there and open the discussion to questions. Okay. Well, thank you very, very much for this uh, excellent presentation.